Good morning. So I'm going to start by just introducing sickle cell disease. And most of this talk is going to focus on allogeneic transplant, which I'll explain, but also be speaking about gene therapy. So sickle cell disease is caused by a point mutation, um, which leads to polymerization of hemoglobin and upon deoxygenation and the transformation of the red blood cells from this uh, flexible biconcave disc to a rigid sickle-shaped cell, which includes the microvasculature, and leads to a lot of the different complications that we see with sickle cell disease. The main one is debilitating painful episodes, which are really, really horrible pain, and they can come any time, so it's really hard for patients to make plans. But also it can cause um, organ damage because the the rigid blood cells keep the um, oxygen from delivering to these these organs. So patients can have strokes, they can have liver disease, um, avascular necrosis, meaning hip replacements in a young age, um, infections, um, sickle retinopathy, which can lead to blindness, um, uh, cardiac disease, pulmonary hypertension, nephropathy leading to kidney failure and dialysis, and really painful leg ulcers. On the y-axis of this figure is the percentage of deaths, and the x-axis is the age at the time of death. And the yellow bar looks at the mortality rate in the 1970s, and the purple bar is the mortality rate in 2006. And if you focus on the left side of the figure, you can see that survival has improved for children due to things like newborn screening, penicillin prophylaxis, and pneumococcal vaccination. But over that same period of time, over the past four decades, there hasn't really been an improvement in uh, survival for adults with sickle cell disease. Uh, The median age of death for adults um, in 2006 was reported to be 39, and at the NIH we reported in 2015 that it was 46. So adults continue to die early. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation offers a curative option for patients with sickle cell disease. The most common type of transplant is where the, the donor is a sibling who's a complete tissue match using myeloblative chemotherapy. So that means you give high doses, of, um, condition, high doses of chemotherapy with the goal of completely replacing the patient's bone marrow with that of the donor. Uh, so there was a study that was re- recently reported where 1,000 patients with sickle cell disease underwent HLA match sibling transplant between 1986 and 2013. And the patients received busulfan, cytoxan, and ATG. And the five-year overall survival was 93%, with an event-free survival of 91%, meaning that 91% of the patients were alive and free of sickle cell disease. But the five-year overall survival was better for children younger than 16, um, and 95% overall survival and 93% event-free survival. And there was a cumulative incidence of grade 2 to 4 acute graft-versus-host disease of about 15%, and chronic graft-versus-host disease of 14%. And chronic graft-versus-host disease occurs when the donor cells um, immune system and recognize the patient as being foreign and attack the patient, and that can cause hardening of the skin and scarring of the lungs, and it can be deadly. So you don't want to replace one disease with with one that could be even potentially worse. So with sickle cell disease, we really don't want to see any graft-versus-host disease because there's no benefit. So I started working with um, John Tisdale, and we wanted to develop a regimen which could be applicable to adults, where many of them have organ damage and cannot tolerate high doses of chemotherapy. So based on a mirroring project, we developed this regimen uh, where we give the patients alemtuzumab, which suppresses the immune system, it depletes the lymphocytes, and it stays around for about a month. So not only are you suppressing the, um, the immune system of the patient, but also that of the donor. We give 300 centigrade radiation in order to make space in the bone marrow and also to provide additional immunosuppression. And then we give this drug sirolimus. And so what we're trying to do with sirolimus is re-educate the immune system so that the donor and the recipient cells can coexist. We found that you actually don't have to completely replace the patient's bone marrow with that of the donor to cure sickle cell disease. And as long as you have about uh, 20% of the red cells coming from the donor, it's enough to reverse sickle cell disease. And that's because of the vast differences in half-life between a normal red cell, which lasts about three months, and a sickled red cell, which only lasts about five to 20 days. So... um, So we're trying to deplete the lymphocytes, create space in the bone marrow, and then have the lymphocytes grow back under the cover of sirolimus so that we'll create this this mixture of donor and recipient cells. So this um, study is being run by Matthew Shea and John Tisdale at the NIH. And I'm going to talk about the results of the first 55 patients that we've transplanted. 54 of them had sickle cell disease and one beta thalassemia. The median age was 29 years with a range of 10 to 65 years. And the median follow-up was about six and a half years, the first patient being transplanted over 14 years ago. 
So of the 55 patients transplanted, 48 of them initially had white cell engraftment, and importantly, we have not seen any graft-versus-host disease on this protocol. 47 of the patients had additional donor red cell engraftment. One of the patients became transfusion dependent, and we found that this patient had an antibody to one of the donor's red cells. Um, and so for about a, a year and a half, he was requiring transfusions. One patient died unexpectedly at seven years post-transplant. One died from a GI bleed. And then seven patients rejected the grafts, and, had, and six patients had a return of their sickle cell disease. One died after a second transplant, and then one um, died from an intracranial hemorrhage at about seven months post-transplant from her uh, sickle cell disease. So the overall survival is 93%, which is similar to what I reported in children with the myeloblative um, regimen. We have not seen any transplant-related mortality, and the event-free survival uh, is 87%. Importantly, unlike a myeloblative regimen where most of the children are expected to not be able to have, have children on their own, eight of our patients have had 13 healthy babies post-transplant. The problem is that only about 15% of patients with sickle cell disease will have a, a sibling who's a complete tissue match. So in order for us to, um, to transplant the first 36 patients, 287 of them underwent HLA typing, and um, 102 were found to have an HLA match. But again, most of these patients were referred to, or a lot of these patients were referred to us because they were already known to have an HLA match sibling. And in the community, again, there's only about a 15% chance that a patient will have a sibling who's a match. So we also offer haploidentical transplantation at the NIH, which is a half-match transplant, so that parents and children and half-match siblings can serve as a donor. Because the tissues are no longer a match, there's a higher risk for graft rejection and a higher risk for graft-versus-host disease. And based on a mirroring project, uh, we developed this protocol um, where all of the patients receive alemtuzumab. Uh, we increased the amount of radiation a little bit to 400 centigrade, and then we all, all the patients got sirolimus. And there were three different cohorts of the study. Um, and again, based on this mirroring project, we, we did it as a dose escalation of post-transplant cyclophosphamide. So the first cohort did not receive any um, post-transplant cyclophosphamide. Uh, the second cohort, uh, then we built stopping rules into the study. So if too many people either rejected their grafts or got graft-versus-host disease, we moved to the second level where they got one dose of post-transplant cyclophosphamide. And then again, if too many rejected, um, they got two doses for a total of 100 milligrams per kilogram. And um, in the first cohort, where there was no cytosan given, we transplanted three patients. One of them initially engrafted, but none of them um, remained um, free of sickle cell disease. So we met stopping rules and moved to the second cohort, where we gave one dose of cyclophosphamide. Um, eight patients were transplanted. Five of them initially engrafted, but only two uh, remained free of sickle cell disease. So when stopping rules were met, we moved to the third and final cohort, where we gave the two doses of cyclophosphamide. Twelve patients were transplanted. Ten of them initially engrafted, uh, but only six remained free of sickle cell disease. So so you can see the addition of cyclophosphamide improved the engraftment rate and the success rate, but we still had a high uh, graft rejection rate. Um, despite these patients having very severe, severe disease, including cirrhosis and dialysis and heart failure, we did not see any mortality before um, day 100. But five patients who rejected their grafts died um, six months and then three, five, seven, and eight years post-transplant, mostly from sickle cell disease-related complications. And then um, John Tisdale is going to talk um, much more about gene therapy, but I just, for the purpose of this talk, I just want to introduce um, uh, what we tell patients about gene therapy. So patients can serve as their own donor. Theoretically, it's available for all patients. There's no need for immunosuppression, and there's no risk of graft-versus-host disease. However, uh, myeloablative conditioning with busulfan is necessary, so that's high dose of chemotherapy, and the short and the long-term success is not known. So I wanted to give you all that background so I can tell you how or talk about how are the patients um, deciding whether or not to move forward with transplant, and then if so, which transplant option to choose. So first, we help them to assess their disease severity. Uh, we define mild disease as crises that are manageable at home or if the patients are having about one hospitalization or less per year. Moderate disease is defined as two or more hospitalizations per year with or without one to two organs injured, and this includes a high tricuspid regurgitant velocity as determined by a transthoracic echocardiogram, a level of 2.5 meters per second or higher is associated with early mortality in adults with sickle cell disease, 
also sickle cell associated liver disease, avascular necrosis of multiple joints, and alloimmunization making it difficult for these patients to receive transfusions. And then severe disease is defined as any permanent organ damage, including a stroke, kidney failure, and cirrhosis, or if they have three or more organs injured. So when we're thinking about enrolling a patient, we have to uh, weigh the benefits and the risks in that individual patient. So the eligibility criteria for our transplant protocols initially included patients at increased risk for early mortality. Since we have much more experience with with the HLA-MAT sibling transplant, we've relaxed those criteria a little bit. Because the toxicity of the haplo um, protocol is a little bit higher, uh, we enroll the more severe patients, so only um, patients who maintain their disease severity despite therapeutic doses of hydroxyurea, which is the only drug we really have to treat these patients. Our newer protocols do not include children because the survival for children is so high that any significant mortality cannot be justified. So 98% of children with sickle cell disease are expected to, in the United States, are expected to survive to 18 years of age. This can be very difficult for our patients because the vast majority of patients who come to us think that they have severe disease, so it's really hard for us to explain to them that you know, we think that you should wait because we don't think your disease is severe enough at this time. So the next steps for patients with moderate to severe disease, um, with HLA-MAC siblings, uh, if they're considering HLA-MAC siblings, then we tell them that the donors are their sibling. There's been about 1,000 patients transplanted worldwide with about 70 at the NIH. The success rate is greater than 90%. And in order to prepare the patients, they have to be around the NIH for about two months, which, um, where they undergo a lot of pre-transplant testing. We titrate up their hydroxyurea, and um, they get red cell exchange transfusions. For the haploidentical transplant, the donors are their parent, their child, or their siblings. There's been about 100 transplants performed worldwide with more than 20 at the NIH. The success rate um, was before was about 50 to 70 percent. It's much better now. Um, but again, the patients have to be in the area for about two months before transplant for all of the testing to titrate up their hydroxyurea for red cell exchange. And we also collect backup stem cells from every patient. And then for gene therapy, the patient can serve as their own donor. There's been about 20 uh, transplants performed worldwide with more than 10 at the NIH. Um, In the first group uh, of about six patients, all partially worked. And in the second group of six patients, um, all have sickle cell trait. They require more um, pre-transplant uh, evaluation and workup, including um, and testing, including um, for two to four months. So we have to stop their hydroxyurea. They need red cell exchange for at least two months, and then they have to collect backup stem cells, not only uh, and also stem cells for gene therapy. Also, with the HLA match sibling, uh, we actually have two um, protocols now. One is um, low-dose radiation and antibody, which is chemotherapy-free. And the other, they receive um, low-dose radiation and antibody and low-dose chemotherapy. Um, They're inpatient for about one and one and a half months, and they're in the NIH area for a total of about four and a half months. (laughs) Regarding fertility potential, they should be able to have kids naturally, and the chances are better if they're younger. And then... um, Testing and storage of sperm and eggs is optional but recommended. With the haplotransplant, they receive low dose of radiation and an antibody, and then two chemotherapies at a higher dose. They're inpatient for about one to one and a half months, and they're around um, the area for about four and a half months. Fertility potential is lessened in the HLA match sibling setting, and testing and storage of uh, sperm and eggs are highly recommended. With gene therapy, there's no radiation, but they'll receive chemotherapy at a high dose. They're inpatient for about one to one and a half months for total um, in the area of about four to six months. Fertility potential is virtually none without help, and testing and storage of sperm and eggs are strongly recommended. So how is the final decision made? I spoke to our recruitment coordinator, and they said most commonly a decision is made um, based on eligibility criteria. So patients with significant organ damage are currently excluded from gene therapy, and then they're referred for haploidentical transplant. But then the next most common reason that patients choose gene therapy is because they feel they've already inconvenienced their family members enough, and they, they like that they can be their own donor. And they do not want to put family members at risk. With haploidentical transplant, they choose it because they do not want to receive full-dose chemotherapy. And both protocols offer ovarian cryopreservation and equivalent stipends, so that's not used to help um, make a decision. And then lastly, I just wanted to share a um, case presentation which shows the challenges that 
uh, the biggest challenge that I feel when um, actually consenting patients for transplant. So this is a 21-year-old African-American gentleman with homozygous sickle cell disease, complicated by stroke, requiring chronic transfusion therapy, recurrent painful crises, and acute chest syndrome, and he also had history of multi-organ failure. The patient and his mother were educated multiple times about the potential benefits and the risks of haploidentical transplant, including graft rejection. At the time of the consent, in April of 2012, he was the ninth patient to be enrolled, and the five patients before him had, five of the nine patients had rejected their grafts. While they understood the potential risks that were mentioned, the mother kept saying that she had faith and she knew the transplant would be successful for him. He underwent his transplant on May 10th of 2012, and his mother was the donor. His neutrophil count initially increased to about 630, 20 days post-transplant, with donor chimerism levels up to 84%. However, he never fully engrafted and remained severely pancytopenic. On July 12th, um, he and his mother were informed that he had rejected the graft, and they were in shock, as if they'd never been told that graft rejection was a possibility. So we wanted to work with our ethics team to talk about the process of decision making for our, our patients with sickle cell disease that are thinking about um, transplant. And they conducted interviews with patients who had made a decision about participation in a transplant trial at the NIH. We sought to evaluate motivations, decision making process, understanding of research, and, um, and retrospective reflections. And 26 patients agreed to be interviewed. So of the 26 patients, the mean age was about 40 years. 10 of the patients were male. Most of them were black or African American. Most had been born in the United States. Regarding the education level, most of them were at the high school level. And about 18 of them said that they were Protestant or other Christian. Uh, seven of the patients were pre-transplant, with half of them on, um, Undergo or deciding to um, choose half match transplant with the other half gene therapy. 13 of them uh, were post transplant, and six of them declined transplant. So these are the experiences that they discussed with sickle cell disease. Half of them ex uh, expressed severe pain, frequent hospitalizations, and transfusions. Half of them had functional limitations. Um, four of them had experienced near-death experiences. About half of the patients said that the health care providers had a poor understanding of sickle cell disease, and nine of them felt they were stigmatized as drug-seeking. And then about half of the patients first learned about the NIH for referral from an outside physician, and four of them referred themselves. So they, we wanted to know whether the patients actually understand the consent process. Two-thirds of them clearly describe the purpose, pur purpose of research as scientific knowledge and or benefiting future patients. All patients expressed an awareness that transplant and gene therapy studies carried side effects and risks including death, cancer, graft-versus-host disease, and HIV. 22 of the 26 acknowledged that the treatment might not work, and their main worries included uh, unsuccessful response, death, pain, and potential long-term side effects. Most patients describe performing a personal risk-benefit ratio when deciding about participation. All patients who decided to enroll cited the intolerability of their current sickle cell symptoms and or hope for a better future without sickle cell disease. They wanted to feel like less of a burden on family members. They wanted to be alive and more present for their children, maintain a job, and finish school. Those who declined enrollment felt that their current status was not bad enough to justify the risks of the trial, and half of the patients referred to altruistic motivations, but none reported altruism as their primary motivation. And then lastly, we wanted to know the role of family, faith, and other patients. So we're asked, what role, if any, did your family have in your decision making? Most of them reported their family provided moral support and reassurance. Did you speak with any other patients who had gone through gene therapy or transplant? Um, seven said no, they had talked to no one. Uh, Eleven said yes, they talked to patients who did well. And five talked to both patients who did well and who did not do well. And then would you consider yourself religious and or spiritual? If so, what role did your faith, if any, have in your decision making? Eleven of them said that they had general support from God and our faith. Nine said that they were religious, uh, but no, they had no role or influence. And then two of them uh, said that they were not religious. So in summary, we must ensure that in each individual patient that the potential benefits outweigh the risks of the transplant. We must clearly state the benefits and risks of each transplant process and standard of care to help patients make an informed decision. And patients rely strongly on their family, other patients, and their faith when making decisions about transplant. Thank you.